call here is to the disciples as we're living our lives, as we are teaching. And by the way, our lives are teaching whether we realize it or not. Okay, our, our lives are witnessing whether we realize it or not. And I want to say today, be alert to that and know what your witness is. All right, and we'll come back to that in just a minute. But I want to give you the reason why this is such an important commandment and, and, so, and it's so important that we as disciples pick this up as followers of Jesus Christ and live this out. Okay, so he says, Go ye therefore while you are going and while you are teaching, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Ghost. So we have here the commandment to go be witnesses. We have here the commandment to go and to share the good news of what Jesus Christ has done. Now, the disciples, they were there. These were the first century church. Okay, they, they were there at the very beginning, at the very ground zero of this thing. And Jesus is saying, go and teach them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Okay, so what was Jesus asking them to share? Because this is an important part of witnessing, all right? There are people, when you go talking about the we, meeting needs, is easy because we can meet needs and without ever really having to be personally involved. We can do that at a distance, so to speak. Building relationships is more risky. It's got more risk to it, but i got to say this to you. Building relationships, it, it, it is risky at times. But guys, the rewards of building relationships are just untold. I mean, we go from adding disciples. When we build relationships, we become multipliers for the Lord. Not just, not just addition, but multiplication. Now, I'm not a math person, all right? But I do know if you're trying to increase numbers really quickly, or if you're trying to get the word out really quickly, or if you're trying to reach a bunch of people with the message of the Lord Jesus Christ, I do know multiplication works a whole lot better than just simple addition, Okay. If you go back, what happened at Pentecost? Well, there was 120 of them in the upper room, all right? But then when they came together and they prayed and the Holy Ghost came and Peter stood up and preached, they didn't just add another 120, okay? They added 3,000. Now, and you can do the math to figure out that multiplication, all right? So we have here teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Well, what had Jesus commanded them, okay? He had commanded them to do good. He had commanded them to love them that were going to despitefully use them. He had commanded them to, to love their enemies. He had commanded them to pray for those who were going to persecute them. He commanded them to, to all of those things, and they were reliving all of those things that he had commanded them. Now, those were his spoken teachings. Those were the spoken, spoken words, okay, if you'll say it that way. But there were other things that he demonstrated to them, all right, that were not just what he said. They were things that he did, okay? And you'll find this really early, early on in the book of Acts. I mean, Peter and James, went, or it might have been Peter and John, went up to the temple that one day, and there was a, a, a gentleman there that was laying there beside the gate called Beautiful, and he asked them for money. And Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have. And what did he have? Well, he'd been with Jesus for three and a half years, okay? He'd seen Jesus do the mighty works. He'd seen Jesus do what Peter was about to do there in Acts chapter, I think it's in Acts 4, 5, or 6 right through there. But Peter reaches and gets the man by the hand and helps him up, and in the name of Jesus Christ, he heals him. Okay? Where did he learn how to do that? Okay? He'd seen Jesus do that. Okay? Now, I know there's a big doctrinal importance in these scriptures, and I'm not trying to take that out. Okay? But there's also a big personal importance to these scriptures, okay? Yes, he is talking to the disciples that are with him there on the mountain. Yes, he, but he is through them speaking to all of us as well. If I am a disciple of Jesus Christ, then I am supposed to be going. I am supposed to be teaching. I am supposed to be witnessing. I am supposed to be doing what Jesus has done. Now, I want to say this to you today. Somebody's sitting here going, well, Brother Jeff, I don't know if I would have a story to tell when you're talking about what Jesus has done. But, and I don't mean to hurt your feelings, but I want to correct you a little bit. Oh, yes, you do have a story to tell. If, if you've been born again by the grace of God, yes, you have a story to tell. If you've ever had a prayer answered, you have a story to tell. If you've ever had God to deliver you when he was the only one who could possibly have done it, you have a story to tell. 
And, and somebody said, Preacher, I could never get up in front of a crowd like you guys do, or Pastor Harris does, or Pastor Barry does, or how you guys get up there and you teach a lesson, or you preach a sermon, or you do those things. I could just never do that. And I want to say this to you. I've, I've got good news for you because that's not the only way this gets done. Okay? If you go back to the book of Acts, yes, it started that way. Okay? In Acts chapter 2, the, the, the promise of the Father comes, and we call that Pentecost. Okay, and we have the, the big happening. Three thousand people get saved, and Simon Peter was, of course, the one up preaching. I won't deny that. Okay, God absolutely used Simon Peter in a way that I promise you, the most surprised person on the face of the earth that day was Simon Peter. Okay, he just knew he was supposed to preach. He had no idea what God was going to do with the labor. Okay, but guys, the next thing that happens is just as important. Okay. They, 3,000 people get saved, yes, okay. The church is formed, yes, okay. But then the church does what the body does, okay. They, the Bible says they, they took care of one another. They went around doing good. They, they looked after each other's needs. They fellowshiped around doctrine. They had time together to build that relationship. And then the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, can I tell you something? The apostles weren't going around winning all those souls of the people who got saved after that day of Pentecost. That was the people. That was the church. That was the church being the church. That was the function there of the New Testament church. So you have, let me just give you this right quick, and then I'll move on to the next part of this. But you have there, we meet needs in His name. Okay, we do that in His name, and then we, we build relationships with God and with one another so that we may strengthen the body of Christ, okay? And then we have sharing the gospel, and this is a big one, that the world may know Him, okay? Not just us, but that the world may know Him. Now, I know I'm preaching to somebody today that, that you are, if I were to call on you to come and to have a testimony time or some kind of time in a service, you'd just faint and fall right out. And, and I get that. I, I, trust me, I do. And I understand that. I'm not saying everybody is equipped or called to this kind of a, of a, of a witness or this kind of a ministry. But I am saying every believer is called of God to be a witness for Jesus Christ. It's not if we can, it's will we. It's not should we, it's will we, okay? So when you look at this uh, with these scriptures, and I I'm, I'm, know I'm sort of running around here today, I want to say this first of all about the biblical Christianity is always a missionary faith. It's meant to be shared. It's meant to be, it's meant to be preached. It's meant to be proclaimed, which we do Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Sometimes through the week we'll have services where we have a preaching service, a public service, or sometimes even like this, this is a proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I will come to that in just a minute. So we, we have who commanded us, and that's Jesus, okay? We have who our example is, and it's the first century church, okay? And then we've got the why, and that's because God has been good to us. We, every one of us, if you're hearing this message today and you're a Christian, you're somebody that has placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, then you know already the goodness of the Lord. You know already, you have experienced already enough of the grace of God to be a witness for Him between here and heaven. And i got to say this to you, Christian. God meant you to be a witness. Now, and, and, and I want to say this to us too, our callings may look different. Now, and I want to say this about the gifts of the Spirit when we talk about this just for a minute. There are people whose, whose witness looks different from mine, okay? My witness is loud. My witness is from the pulpit. My witness should also be in private, too. Some of my most very favorite mem ministry memories, if I can get that out like that, some of my most favorite ministry memories are of me praying with somebody to be saved privately or somebody, a young person coming and having questions and me may able to help that person to be saved. A lot of people don't get saved in a church setting. I think that somehow we've got it in our minds that the only way people can be saved is if they have to come here. Or they have to be on the premises in order to become a Christian. And I want to say, thank God, when people get saved in a service or in a public forum, what a, what a time of rejoicing and what a great hallelujah moment that is. All right? But guys, the vast majority of people don't get saved in a church setting, in a church service setting especially. All right? It happens organically. It happens at home. That's why we try to make sure our, we teach our parents how to witness to your children. And by the way, 
we believe that that's our first witness ought to be to our families, all right? And even to the point to where we've even said, be sure, and, and I'm going to talk about how to witness here in a minute, but I wanted to make sure that I'm, I'm getting the point to you that we need to be witnesses right where we are. In, in our scriptures, if you go back over to Acts chapter 1, and I'm not going to get you guys to turn over there for just the sake of time, but I want to read just one verse there, Acts chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says, But you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. 